Hello everyone and welcome back to our UE5 AI series where we're covering all the things to do with AI in UE5. In this episode we're going to continue looking at our EQS systems and we're going to go through a few more tests that are available to you in the EQS uh, tools. So let's get started and take a look at some of these options. So the last time we looked at EQS, we went through two of the tests. We went through distance and trace, but there are a few others to take a look at. So let's take a look at our EQS demo we made last time with our grid generator. And we're going to right click on here and add a new test. And we're going to choose the dot test. Now the dot test is basically going to draw two lines. One line is going to go from the uh, context, so like the one of the spheres that you see in the EQS uh, uh, debug. Uh, one of their and um, which way they are rotating um, between them and our, in this case, querier, as you see here, item and querier. The other line is going from just the querier. So which way is the querier facing versus which way is the item and the querier to each other? And what it's basically going to be doing is going to say, if these two are facing the same way, it's going to equal a value of one. If they're opposite each other, it'll be negative one. And if they're perpendicular to each other, they'll be zero. So to show this in action, if I change this to be, uh, let's just do score uh, filter only. And I'll just do a minimum of, uh, we'll do a minimum of zero. There you go. Okay, so if I take this one here, you can see our EQS testing pawn, it's filtering out all the ones behind him. Okay, that's because I said the minimum value has to be zero. And as I said, anything behind them uh, would be like facing the opposite way. Therefore, it would be um, negative one. So you only want to see it filtering the top half there. Now, if I change that value, if I go back to here to zero to say 0.5, I get a minimum of 0.5. You can see now more of a cone shape appearing. Okay, so imagine the way this is working is imagine like we've got the query here and which way they're facing. So we've got a line going from this direction that way. And each item is also getting a line um, from them to the query. Okay, so if it is, or oh, it might be the other way around, query to the item. Hang on, let's so come over now. Which way it is? It is query to the item. Yeah. So another line going from here to the item. So the more similar they are in direction, those two lines, the closer it will be to one. And if I go back to that test and change this to a range and do a minimum value of, let's say, uh, minus 0.5 and 0.5 positive 0.5 is the max you see we get this sort of hourglass shape where we just get the sides of them so this is very useful if you want them to try and pick a location that is say flanking your current location for example it's very good for doing things like that um so they avoid standing right in front of you uh, likewise you can make them always stand behind you you know um you can try we can try and uh, use navigation to get around the attacks and so on. But that's dot. And scoring, as I said, um, goes between one and minus one. So you see it like this. Yeah. So one is here, minus one. Well, well it doesn't go negative, so it'll be just zero. But all these behind it are zero. Uh, because you can't do minus one. But imagine it says minus one. And then over here, it goes to 0. 0.5. And then 0. 0.5 over here too. Okay, so you can also do gradiated ones like this. Okay, so that's a dot product. Very useful. I use that one quite a bit. Um, next, we'll go add another one and gameplay tags. So gameplay tags works well when you are trying to match for a particular uh, gameplay tag. Um, so if you have gameplay tags set up, um, if I were to, uh, I don't know, I don't really have any setup really here, but you can do like all tags matching, um, all except one, all except two, you, you know, you can do all sorts of queries with that. Um, and it'll return, oh, um, and it'll return a value based on that score there 
um, on what items are available. This works best when you are drawing uh, items onto a particular item. So rather than a grid, for example, it's better if you use this for when you're generating items on top of other actors. Um, so it doesn't, so each item is then tied to an actor. So, yeah. Uh, next, we've got uh, overlap. So overlap's a weird one because you have to kind of use your imagination a bit. So what we have to do is we'll just do filter only for now. Over here, you can set up extents of X, Y, Z. Uh, an extent, remember, is a half value. So the full width of this shape is 20, 20, 20. And it's a box shape, as you see, overlap shape box. And it's got overlap channel of world static. So what does this do? Well, if I close that, uh, I might need to make this bigger. Uh, yeah, I do have to make it bigger. So if I go into here, I can make it a bit bigger. We'll change that to, we'll make it a lot bigger. We'll do 100 by 100. Actually, no, not 100 by 100. Uh, 50, 50, 50. Um, I explain why 100 wouldn't probably be good. Yeah, there you go. So as you can see here, it's filtering out um, everything except for those that have got are close to a wall. So imagine that each item is generating this box shape around it. And it's detecting if that box shape collides with anything of world static. In other words, anything of the world geometry here. Um, as you can imagine, this is very useful for um, finding places behind walls and cover, things like that um yeah it is pretty useful for a variety of things like that um the filter out you can also inverse it so you, you can make them so they don't stay near walls um try and keep them more center so if i would change this to ball match to be false um it would now be the other way around okay and you've got other shapes you can do stuff with there so you've got box sphere and capsule and you can change the shape size here. Now, if I were to make this too big, though, so let's say I made it 100, 100, 100. Oh. And change the ball match here to true again. You can see they're all being triggered. And that's because it's too tall. It's going into the floor. So you combat that by just making it not as, not as high. Oh, I want. Um, so you just go back to here and change the Z here to like 10. For example, so now you can imagine you've got that thin, wide box on here instead. And you can see them now colliding a lot better. So you can probably imagine there's some quite good uses for this. Um, so do play about with it. Okay, next. We've got a test, pathfinding, and pathfinding batch. So both of these are pretty much functioning the exact same way. Um, I've never had to use the batch one. Um, from my understanding of it, it is a bit more accurate when it comes to the nav mesh, but I don't un don't fully understand or see the difference personally. Um, but I'm sure it does. But anyway, the path uh, finding one uh, basically says, can it reach this point? So it's quite good to put this on as a sort of like error checker. Um, so if I put this here, for example, you can see if I move this out a little bit. These ones are being filtered out because it can't reach this platform. There's no way for it to reach. Yeah. So you have to be very careful. Um, it, you want to be very careful when you're telling the uh, AI to try and reach something that it can't reach because it will just fail. And it's usually caused the most bugs I see when people are using AI navigation. Um, is it's, their navigation's failing. So this can help filter that out and stop that from happening. And it will only pick spaces now that are actually viable and uh got a couple of more we've got project so on project what this will do is it will help push uh items that are inside collidable objects up and out so a few things you can see here already happening um when you put in that generation nav mesh here you can see some are generating under and inside objects which is obviously not good. And you can also see it actually taken into effect here. These ones would have been pushed inside of this shape, but I've now been pushed to the side. See how these are a lot closer? And it's been basically projected out away from here. Now, the reason why these ones have been moved, but these ones haven't, is because these are generating based upon the navigation. 
So over here, you've got trace mode navigation and navigation filters and, and things like that. Uh, but navigation means that it's going to use the nav mesh. So if I push P here, you can see all the ones that weren't going to be on the nav mesh were getting pushed aside until they were on the nav mesh. So it projects those back out here. Now the ones underneath here are doing fine because nav mesh is actually generating underneath here. Um, it's just inaccessible. So if you want to stop that from happening, you go into your project settings and change it from navigation to geometry by channel. And if I change it, a trace channel here to invisibility the camera, or I can change its shape here too, I can now do some like a, like a line trace type thing where it will now push it up and out of this shape because it has the collision of the geometry rather than nav mesh. But you can see it's pushed those up and no longer kept in here. So it's another good way to ever checking to stop things getting um, uh, lost with inside the shapes of your uh, actor here. But yeah. And the last one we have here is a volume. So the volume is very similar to the overlap one, but this one you can set a volume source itself. So you are you can set this as a any kind of mesh or shape you want. Um, as you can see, here we've got no volume context set, and here's this volume context. So you make a context, put the, plug in the actor that you want to use and it will use that shape instead. Um, but I'd say I rarely ever use this because I find the overlap one works just fine for 99% of what I'm trying to do. So yeah, um, but that's what it does. You just give it a volume context um, or class if you want. So you can give it like a trigger volume or something um, and it will check whether they're inside that volume. And there you go, we've now got a uh, understanding of, of the tools that are in play in our EQS tool. In the next episode, we're going to go through the process of actually applying EQS to make our AI find cover. So you can watch the next episode right now over on patreon.com forward slash Ryan Laley, where you can find all my videos early from just $1 a month. A massive thank you to all my patrons and YouTube members for their continued support in me and the channel. Thanks for watching, make sure you're subscribed, and I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.